All right, any questions from last time? Anyone looked at the material from last time since then? Okay. Don't lie. Just kidding. No. <laughs> you guys are busy. Understand. Anyway, um, let's continue on the GI stuff. We're going to talk about antiemetics. Um, so we can use them for several purposes, obviously for nausea and vomiting. Is there any way you guys can like lower that blind in the back corner? It's like reflecting off that table. I appreciate it. Um, so we use it a lot for motion sickness. Thank you. Um, Post-operative nausea and vomiting. Uh, and we do this quite frequently with uh, our chemotherapy patients. When we cover chemo, we're going to see that that's one of the primary side effects is a lot of nausea and vomiting. So we're going to use a lot of these drugs in order to treat that. So this stuff will come back up in a heavy way when we get to um, talking about chemotherapy next semester. So there's lots of different places where we can um, have emetic effects occurring in the body. So for instance, a lot of this is occurring not only in the GI tract specifically, where we have things like uh, serotonin receptors. Um, another way we can abbreviate serotonin is 5-HT. It goes back to its chemical name. So just if you see 5-HT, automatically so I'm talking about serotonin. Okay. Um, but a lot of these are going to end up working centrally. So we will see that by working with the vomiting center up in the, in the medulla, you're going to have uh, dopamine receptors. So those D receptors we're talking about there, D2 primarily. You're going to have muscarinic receptors, or obviously muscarinic receptors being activated by acetylcholine. What does that normally do to the GI tract? Yeah, so it's a parasympathetic nervous system, right? So it's going to help kick it into high gear, right? So again, you can imagine how it's going to lead to nausea and vomiting. So we're going to see a lot of anti-muscarinics will end up uh, affecting those types of receptors. Uh, and then we're going to see some kind of um, kind of ancillary ones, kind of miscellaneous agents we'll talk about a little bit later. But these are the primary things um, we're going to be focusing on as far as receptors go. So again, notice the receptors we're dealing with. This will inform a lot of the side effects you're going to see with these drugs. Um, so kind of keep these relationships in mind. So... First ones we're talking about are anti-muscarinic drugs. Oh, sorry, I should mention um, I redid this GI lecture. I reposted it, so um, double check on that. There's a couple slides I took out of there, mostly um, some of the stuff out of the Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. You can just skip those if you have the old version. That's fine. Um, the renal stuff I went ahead and just took down and completely redid, so those are those are now posted back up. So just FYI. Anyway, um, starting with our anti-muscarinic drugs. These are obviously going to antagonize muscarinic receptors up in the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Primary one we're going to have here is called scopolamine or transderm scope. So has anyone ever been on a cruise and uh, seen them with a little patch behind their ear? That's what they're using. That's an anticholinergic. Big thing to note with that is that it is, you know, transdermal drugs, they kick in immediately. No, it takes time, right? It has to diffuse through the skin. It's going to take a while. So it's one of those things where if you have a patient here who's about to go on a cruise and you're uh, prescribing them, you know, this scopolamine, you need to let them know to take it a few days beforehand to start putting it on so that way it has time. Once they are already on the boat, it's too late at that point, right? So it's going to, by the time they, you know, if it's a three-day cruise, by the time it really kicks in, they're on their last day anyway, and so it's not going to be super useful for them. So this is nice because it's applied every three days, so you don't have to you know, change it continuously. And make sure you really wash your hands. If you ever have a patient who shows up with something like this, does anyone know what you would think about if you saw patients' pupils that look like this? Probably think like a brain bleed or something like that. Typically, like, you know, uh, one side of the uh, brain being affected versus the other. But that, that's usually not a great sign. But if you had a history of, hey, they were putting on this transderm scope, uh, this patch recently, and accidentally rubbed their eyes, you could certainly see that. So it's just like we've uh, going back to the opto section. If you put atropine into someone's eyes, that's another anti-muscarinic that would cause the same thing, cause that dilation and the mydriasis of the pupil, right? Um, again, most often used for things like motion sickness. So again, boats are a big place you're going to see that being used, especially here being in Orlando, which is kind of close by at yeah, the beach. But then that's where we have uh, uh, Port Canaveral, right? So that's where a lot of uh, cruise ships take out of. And so we get a lot of um, patients who are, you know, they're going to be heading that direction. So imagine. A lot of the side effects associated with these drugs are going to be the same uh, as it affects muscarinic receptors throughout the body. You're going to see things like blurred vision, as you can see right here on that picture, um, dry mouth, urinary retention, dried mucous membranes, urinary, you know, all that stuff, uh, constipation potentially. So anywhere where you're going to be affecting the muscarinic receptors, you know, we're not just being selective for the ones that are working with nausea and vomiting centers, but we're working kind of throughout the body. There are several antihistamine drugs we're also going to use for their anti-muscarinic properties. So again, most of these are going to be first-generation antihistamines. Why can't we use second-generation antihistamines for this? Why don't they have the, that effect? There you go. Yeah. So they can't get into the, the can't get into the CNS, right? They don't cross the blood-brain barrier. That's why they're non-sedating. You're looking at second-generation antihistamines. What was there some second-generation antihistamines you can use? Zyrtec, Claritin. 
Allegra, right? So this is the common ones. Um, we're using first generation, so we want these to cross the blood-brain barrier. We want them to get in, in and work centrally. So you have things like diamondhydronate or dramamine. Um, you have things like promethazine or fenergan. That's the one that's really good because it has a rectal form that's available. So if a patient is really, really having a ton of nausea and vomiting, you can give it uh, to them uh, rectally because, again, if they throw out the medication, you can't absorb it very well. And, again, sedation is going to be a main side effect you're going to see with this. So antimuscarinic actions in the CNS causes uh, sedation. Yes, ma'am. These are just sample. These are kind of the common ones you're going to see being used, but there's nothing saying you couldn't use like doxylamine. You couldn't use diphenhydramine. Nah, it's just it's just one of those things where like certain drugs just get used for certain indications for whatever reason. So like meclizine is another one I could have put on this list that gets commonly used. Uh, antivert, you see that used with a lot of vertigo. They'll have a little bit of antihistamine action, um, but, you know, it's, again, going into the other stuff it is doing. I mean, promethazine has some antidopaminergic action, which is, will be important for some of these other drugs. Uh, anticholinergic action, you know, so they, they kind of have uh, kind of a wide swath of things they're, they're causing. That makes sense? Or do you have... Yeah, and so and you'll see like you know certain benzos like certain benzodiazepines get prescribed for alcohol withdrawal. And there's nothing magical about any particular benzodiazepine. They can all work similarly. But they all have the same action, right? So this is the same thing where certain drugs get marketed towards a certain indication, and so that's one that gets kind of mentally associated with it. So Finnegan. Benadryl work as an anti-emetic as well. For sure. Yeah, just like you know. Um, the potency may differ. So like Finnegan is like super potent. I don't know. I mean, I. I it's all a matter of dose. Yeah. So again, you, you try a little bit, if it doesn't work, try adding some more, right? So it's one of those things where obviously you can't take it back once it's already in the system. But, you know, if it's a thing, uh, thing where, like, you know, I know whenever I go to do this particular thing, I get really nauseous. Like, you know, that's one of those things where you can try to take doses beforehand to kind of feel for how the drugs are going to affect you. But, yeah, same side effects, same, same indications. These are just kind of some representative ones we, we commonly think of. Yeah. Um, next, we have our anti-serotonergic drugs. These are very potent uh, anti-emetic uh, agents. They used to be um, you know, more expensive, but nowadays you have a lot of generic varieties that are available, and so these get used pretty much like water, especially in the ER. Uh, primary ones you're going to see being used is uh, ondansetron or Zofran. There's also uh, Dilacetron and then Granesetron. Um, ondansetron is the one that gets used probably as a lion's share of the market, but you're going to see potentially things like Hytral being used in um, chemo uh, patients. You know, uh, people have very significant nausea, vomit, maybe not uh, treated very well with ondansetron. This is kind of some backup agents. But essentially what they're going to do is work both in the stomach and also in the CNS to inhibit those serotonin-3 receptors. You're going to find that, you know, serotonin has, um, you know, 15 different subtypes of receptors here. But this is a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, and that's important because when we're talking about things like migraines, you're going to be looking at different types of serotonin receptors. You want to keep those straight. Um, otherwise, you can end up, um, you know, prescribing the wrong drug potentially for, for that indication. So just keep that in mind. Um, very effective for chemotherapy, induced nausea and vomiting. So this is kind of a cornerstone of therapy for those patients. We'll talk about chemo in, in another semester. But cisplatin is one that's like really, really nasty for causing um, significant nausea and vomiting. So it's you know, again, a good place for us to use it. Um, very well tolerated. Not a ton of side effects associated with these. But the big thing you have to watch out for is QT prolongation. Um, they can all do it. It's all kind of a dose-dependent effect. And so if you have a bunch of other drugs that are on board, they're also prolonging QT. This is when it becomes an issue. It's a single drug by itself, not really that big of a deal. But again, if you have, you know, a bunch of chemo medications that you're on, a bunch of immunosuppressives that you're on, they're all prolonging QT, add this on, could be the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak. So just be cognizant of that. Check an EKG if you're concerned about it. Uh, next, we have some anti-dopaminergic drugs. So these are just going to be drugs that are blocking D2 receptors. So this is very important because when we're looking at um, psych drugs next semester, um, dopamine 2 receptors are going to be super, super important there. Also, does anyone know what other kind of neurologic disease state is mediated through dopamine or lack thereof? Hmm? Hmm? No, uh, not depression so much. We'll have like one drug that uses it with depression. Uh, it can happen to some older patients. Michael J. Fox has it. Parkinson's. Yeah, Parkinson's. Alzheimer's is going to be more related towards acetylcholine, but uh, Parkinson's is the big thing. So when we get into that, we'll talk about how a lack of dopaminergic neurons has uh, major effects on, on movement, right? So movement's very important uh, for dopamine to work through through some of these nigrostriatal tracts and things like that in the brain. Um, so you're going to see a lot of uh, similarities with these side effects. And in fact, when you have high doses of some of these dopamine 2 receptor blockers being used, um, you can actually see Parkinson-like side effects. 
Okay, so we'll talk about a few of them here that are used more for uh, antimatic actions or prokinetic actions. When I say prokinetic, you guys know what that means in a GI sense? Moving the GI tract, right? So we're going to be stimulating movement, stimulating peristalsis, uh, defecation, all of that. Um, and so we used to use drugs like metoclopramide or Reglan very frequently used to use huge doses for chemotherapy before we had the serotonin antagonist. And you can induce this kind of... Uh, uh, Parkinson's like kind of syndrome in them and for some people it'd be irreversible um, but it's one of those things where like you know uh, does anyone like to throw up no it's the worst thing in the world right so again a lot of these patients um, they would rather have these kind of side effects and not have to have to deal with the nausea and vomiting associated with chemo um, so it's one of those things that kind of is, is a trade-off so that's why the the serotonin antagonists were such a big deal when they came along but anyway they're they're antagonizing these d2 receptors up in that chemoreceptor trigger zone there in the medulla. Um, and so these antidopaminergic drugs are still going to have some anticholinergic activity as well. So it kind of has some dual mechanisms here. Um, and so that's why you're going to see a little bit of fatigue associated with it, with maybe some dizziness, sedation there. Um, and what's interesting is you can also end up seeing these kind of Parkinson-like side effects. I mean, you think Parkinson's, does anyone know what kind of issues come about with Parkinson's? Yeah, so you get some tremors at rest. They have a hard time initiating movement is one of the issues. They have also this kind of pill rolling thing that happens there, and then um, they have this kind of shuffling gait. Those are kind of the three kind of primary things. You can see some of that with these really high doses associated with this. It also, you're going to find that um, when you block dopamine, you have an increase in prolactin, and that can lead to things like um, gynecomastia in men. It can lead to um, issues with um, uh, normal menstrual cycles in female patients. You know, so um, remember that uh, PCOS? Remember we talked about that? Like that's a prolactin component as well to it. Um, patients with uh, hyperprolactinemia cannot usually uh, ovulate uh, easily and, 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 and get pregnant. So this is another uh, problem you can run into that. And lastly, kind of the most serious side effect you can run into, and you'd really only see this with really big doses, or if you're mixing drugs that uh, have um, uh, multiple drugs that have dopamine receptor antagonism, you have what we call neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Um, and so it's a rare side effect. And, and uh, has anyone ever heard of like serotonin syndrome? We'll talk about it, and they, they seem kind of similar to one another. Different drugs will do it, but basically this neuroleptic malignant syndrome is something where you have this kind of lead pipe rigidity that happens, and so basically you'll have the patients. I've had a few um, patients who had overdosed on like methamphetamine and, and uh, different types of illegal drugs that develop this, and essentially they just cannot relax their muscles. They're locked in this kind of state where they cannot bend them to relax, and you can't do anything with them, and when you have the muscles in a constant state of contraction like that, what do you think happens? Muscles just really just strain themselves. So you have muscle breakdown, you can have heat being produced, you can have rhabdomyolysis, you can have all kinds of issues popping up here. So you're very hyperthermic, you get acidotic, it's no good. So um, just be aware that's a, a rare side effect, but it's something that can happen if you had someone who's taking metoclopramide plus, you know, a bunch of psych meds that were blocking dopamine. It's a rare thing, but it's someone you want to be aware of. So when they develop it, you can treat it effectively, which we're not, we'll cover that later in the psych section uh, next semester. Um, we can also use cannabinoids, and this is important because what law got passed within the past year or so? <laughs> medical marijuana, yeah. So medical marijuana is something, and in, in, has anyone reviewed that law at all for the indications? Lots of different indications. PTSD, you can use it for anxiety, you can do it for nausea vomiting, you can use it for, um, I'm trying to remember the other ones, like fibromyalgia. Huh? Did you migraines yet? Uh, I don't remember if migraines is on there, but the, the nice thing is that at the very end of it, it says, you know, whatever your provider thinks it might be effective for, essentially. So it kind of gives you carte blanche to, to do it. And so again, you have to go through special training and all of that. I don't know if uh, there's any uh, provisions for mid-level practitioners to do it yet, but at least not at least the, the docs who are set up for it. Um, you know, there's special rules around how long a patient has to be in your care, things like that. What I always thought was interesting is like, why do we need actual marijuana when we have uh, medicinal components already available? So we had this around, this dronabinol or marinol around for years prior to us even thinking about medical marijuana, uh, at least in Florida from like kind of a serious standpoint. So before Morgan and Morgan, came along and kind of threw all that money towards it. We had, we had dronabinol available, and we so we can use this um, for uh, patients with chemo-induced nausea, vomiting. Um, the other thing is, what's a kind of common side effect? You think about someone who's like smoking pot, um, what type of effects would you expect to see? You've never been around anyone like this, I know. That's okay. But if you've seen on TV... Increased appetite, absolutely, yeah. So that's another one of those things where, like, if you're receiving chemotherapy or say you have HIV and you're on all these, like, immunosuppressive meds and you're on all these all these drugs, right, you're like, you know, you're just not hungry. Like, you just don't want to eat. And so malnutrition's an issue, uh, losing weight. So this can be one of those things where you kind of you give them the munchies, so to speak, and, and they, they tend to put on weight, which is a beneficial thing for a lot of these patients. And essentially, this is a synthetic form of delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or just THC. You can just call it that, and that's basically the same thing. So, again, this is not actually derived from a plant. We made this in a lab, but it's the same chemical structure, essentially, right? Um, 
Now, the most common place we're going to use this, nausea, vomiting associated with chemo. We use this a lot, and, and even we'll give this over to our kids at, over at Nemour, so it seems odd that we're giving them THC, but again, it's not for recreational purposes. It's strictly for nausea, vomiting, and try to stimulate their appetite there. Um, and again, what other effects do you expect to see in someone who's on marijuana? Hmm? Yeah, so what type of issues? Yeah, so you can get some of that euphoria from it. So this is a controlled substance. So this is actually, uh, I believe, a Schedule Three substance. You guys remember we talked about uh, controlled substances? What was it got the highest level you could have? Yeah, Schedule One was those that didn't have any any medical use, right? And you have C2s, which are like your your Percocets and your lower tabs and things like that. And you have like C3s, which are kind of more, uh, again, less abuse potential as you go on down. I believe this is a C3. I have to double check, but I won't touch you on that. But just know this is, is a controlled substance. It's something you have to keep locked up in the pharmacy to make sure, you know, patients are, you know, whether healthcare practitioners are not trying to, uh, to steal it or anything like that. So again, just think about the the CNS effects. You have you know potentially regularly hallucinations. You know for, for the most part, it's pretty well tolerated. Um, but again, the increase in appetite can be a good thing for some patients and can be a bad thing for other patients, especially if they're already overweight to begin with. You know things like that. And again, if anyone ever gives you the argument that man, they put pot on the earth for us to smoke. It's natural. It's safe. I also tell them, listen, this is where we get um, digoxin from in plants. We get cyanide from peach pits. Like, there's lots of dangerous stuff that's out there. So I'm not saying I'm an advocate for or against uh, medical marijuana. I'm just saying there's risk with everything, right? So be aware of that. It's not the magical cure-all. Because you'll have patients be like, well, I don't want drugs. I just want the, I just want the medical marijuana. <laughs> okay, let's Let's go back and let's try the other stuff first, and we'll, we'll talk more about that a little bit in the pain management section because that's another indication where you might see a lot of patients trying to use it, right? So, um, again, the evidence is, is there is evidence for its efficacy, not anything where it's like, yes, this is a slam dunk, this is the best drug ever. So since that's like synthetic, what if like you try to get a job or something, will it like pop up with THC? If you're what do you think? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, we'll show it for And so it's one of those things where you know, in, in a normal urine drug screening that you get at a, a typical employer, um, they'll test for opioids, right? And you can be on chronic opioids, that's okay, but you need to be able to prescribe, uh, to show documentation you have a prescription from a, a physician or, or another healthcare provider for it. This will show up at the same extent as, wow. Yeah, the, I, I'm not sure how long, you know, a lot of it has to do with the chronicity of use, like how long you've been on it for and the, the dose you're on and things like that, so how long you'll stay positive for, but yeah, that would show up just like, you know, just like high amounts of poppy seeds can show up as, as opioids, right? So again, it all has to do with the dose and how close the structure is to the, the thing they're testing for and if it cross-reacts with the assay. And so in this case, because it's the, the same chemical, it, yeah, it's absolutely show up, right? Um, does anyone know what Sudafed shows up as? No. Sudafed will show up as methamphetamine. Yep, absolutely. Um, Lots of other drugs. There's lots of cross activities that kind of goes beyond our scope. But just know, just because someone has a, a positive test for uh, a drug on a urine drug screen does not necessarily mean that, one, they are acutely on it, right? It also does not mean that's actually what they are showing positive for. And also, there's lots of false negatives. So just because it doesn't show up with anything doesn't mean they're not on something, okay? So, again, it's beyond our scope, but just keep that in mind. So those are kind of the, the more common antimatics we're going to use. Obviously, dronabinol is going to be used more in, a, uh, in those cases of like chemo patients and, and things like that. Um, we also have these other kind of really, really potent antimatics called substance P antagonists. Does anyone know where substance P uh, is, what kind of food it's associated with? Or some of you guys talking about going to get Indian food? Anything? Spicy, spicy food, right? So you think about peppers, chili, things like that. Um, they're very, very spicy, and it's mediated through substance P, right? Because, you know, when you have substance P activated, it's activating those little pain receptors. You get that heat. Uh, and so this is actually a, a substance P antagonist. It actually blocks substance P in the, in the chemoreceptor trigger zone uh, and can actually um, uh, be a very potent antiemetic. And I guess if you ate something spicy enough, I've never been to that point. I've been close, but you can obviously induce nausea and vomiting in, in a lot of those patients. So um, knock on wood, though. Um, Anyway, so one of the problems you run into with chemotherapy is you can not only have kind of acute uh, nausea and vomiting associated with just getting the drug immediately, but you can also have this delayed nausea and vomiting that happens, say, two to three days afterwards. And so a lot of patients get this delayed phase nausea and vomiting. This is where this drug, uh, Prepotent or Amend, can helpful or be very helpful in, in preventing um, that kind of delayed nausea and vomiting. So um, you're going to find that, like things like 5-HT receptor antagonists like serotonin, uh, like uh, uh, dancitron, I should say, work very well for that acute phase. The substance P uh, antagonists are going to be better for that delayed phase, which is nice. And so uh, it has this NK1 receptor. This is a substance P receptor. This is what it's blocking, essentially. And so we'll give it along with the chemotherapy and then for two days afterwards, essentially, to make sure they don't have that delayed nausea and vomiting. Um, this does interact with CYP3A4. So we'll see some inhibition thereof. So you want to make sure to look at those interactions and make sure you need to adjust levels of other drugs if need be. So just be aware of that. 
Okay. Um, so those are the main antiemetic drugs you're going to use. Again, you imagine most patients who are coming into the ER, the urgent care, something like that. Most often, the most common drug they're going to get is Zofran is the most common one, right? So again, the nice thing about Zofran is you miss a lot of those sedation side effects. You miss a lot of that. those other issues that pop up with that. And that's why Zofran is so commonly used nowadays because it's generic and it's cheap, relatively speaking. Um, and you'll get that same sedation you would get with like a Phenergan or you get with, um, you know, like a, a Meclizine or something like that. So um, just be aware of those side effects, you know, especially if you imagine someone who wants to, you know, go on a cruise, they want to be laid up because they're, you know, taking a nap all the time because they're so tired from medication. No, you want to be able to get up and get around and do their thing. Um, so that's why, again, these, the serotonin antagonists are kind of the first line drugs you're going to go with in a lot of cases. Okay. But uh, prescription only, so that's kind of the one uh, downfall. A lot of those anticholinergics, uh, any histamine specifically, you can find over the counter, which is, is beneficial. So things like um, diamond hydronate, uh, Benadryl, doxalamine, all those you can find over the counter, which is uh, kind of an easy, cheaper way to, to treat that if you needed to. Anywho. Um, so sometimes you need prokinetic agents. Sometimes you can have patients have gastroparesis. Anyone know what that is? Paralysis of the GI tract, essentially. So you can have patients have an issue. Sometimes you'll have this with diabetic patients who get a diabetic uh, neuropathy that can occur with that GI, that kind of enteric GI nervous system. Um, you can see this sometimes in, in people who have like kind of physical obstructions and things like that. So we have a lot of kids who end up having um, uh, kinetic issues being put in, on these medications. But uh, Reglan is a very good one for that. Um, so we talked about this before. It's nice because it's an antiemetic. And again, if you have very significant gastroparesis and you can't get things past the stomach, um, what might be a side effect from that? Can't go down. It's going to go, it's going to go up, right? So again, nausea, vomit can be uh, very much associated with uh, gastroparesis. That's kind of a nice thing about this is they're antiemetic and it'll also kind of help to propulse things along, essentially. Just know it's going to be related back to this uh, dopamine receptor um, uh, antagonism, right? So it's affecting those D2 receptors. And what you're going to find is that when you have um, that normally when you have D2 activation, you actually suppress acetylcholine release. So uh, dopamine and, and acetylcholine in the CNS are kind of like on a seesaw. So if I have too much dopamine activity, I have too little acetylcholine and vice versa. Uh, and then so essentially if I can block dopamine, then I can increase release of acetylcholine. We said acetylcholine is very important to the GI tract because it does what? Stimulates movement, right? So again, you might imagine as well that if you can uh, are stimulating this GI tract, um, what's the potential side effect you're going into? Diary, absolutely. So that's one thing you want to watch out for. So again, same side effects here, same um, uh, risk for things like the prolactin increases, that neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Uh, just be aware, this is a common one we'll use as a prokinetic agent um, due to that acetylcholine activity that has by blocking dopamine. It's kind of an indirect uh, effect there. Another one we have is called cisapride or propulsive. This one actually got removed from the market. It's kind of interesting how, um, you know, different receptor activity can lead to very different effects here. And so this is uh, actually, this drug was a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, but actually was an agonist of 5-HT4, right? So it's just a different type of serotonin receptor. And what they actually ended up seeing is that when you gave that, it was actually prolonged QT to such a degree that uh, not, not only that, but they're having CYP3-4 interactions and whatnot, actually was leading to arrhythmias and actually got it removed from the market. So again, be careful, even just slightly different receptor activity can lead to some pretty significant side effects there. So that one's off the market, so you don't have to worry about that one so much. The more common one you'll see used is metoclopramide or Reglan, and then we'll also use erythromycin. So erythromycin is interesting because erythromycin is normally used as antibiotic, right? So we think of antibiotics, you know, antibiotics can cause diarrhea. Why is it usually causing diarrhea? Yeah, it kind of disrupts your normal gut flora. So if you interrupt that, then you can end up having, um, you know, a lot of diarrhea associated with that. This actually works a little bit differently. You might have a little bit of that uh, that effect there. But um, the other thing it's going to actually do is interact with these motilin receptors. You have motilin receptors throughout the GI tract. When you activate that by giving erythromycin, you cause prokinetic activity. So this is probably, at least from a PEED standpoint, this is the number one place where I see erythromycin being used. A little bit ophthalmic, mainly used for its prokinetic activity. We very rarely do we use that as an actual antibiotic uh, for that purposes. But again, as you might imagine, anything stimulating the GI tract, you can see cramps. Um, sometimes you have patients who actually be on this for a long enough period of time where they actually become kind of dependent on it to a degree, and they can actually impair motility in the, in the long run. So you have to be kind of careful with it. Make sure you're titrating off if needed, uh, depending on, on, on your patient. Yes, ma'am. about We haven't really run into too many issues where, because again, it's um, the infections that you would treat with 
a macro lie, usually on GI bugs, right? So it's usually not um, anaerobes you're trying to, to fight, you know, usually not a ton of like really significant gram negatives. So clinically, you don't really run into huge issues. And we're not like on the same kind of like standard doses that you would be for like an, an, an actual infection. So you're kind of using lower doses, which typically you think might be uh, related to resistance, but clinically we don't see a lot of issues. And things like azithromycin still retain the, uh, efficacy, which is, which is good. So, uh, but certainly that is a, a concern to consider. So like if you had a patient who's on erythromycin like for the past like couple years for prokinetic, um, you know, azithromycin might not be a good go-to drug, right? So if they develop an atypical pneumonia, I want to treat that, then I might use something that el something else that has atypical activity, which what could I use instead? I think it was on our test. So uh, fluoroquinolone would be fine, right? Fluoroquinolones are really good at, at, at atypical coverage and strep pneumo and things like that. So if you couldn't use macrolides, which everyone uses fluoroquinolone, right? Normally like to hold off on those, but that's a very good indication where you might actually want to do that, right? Okay. So that's it for the primary things that prevent nausea and vomiting and kind of the prokinetic agents. Now we're going to move into the laxatives. So these drugs, obviously, are going to increase motility. This is not really the same type of motility. Uh, you, you wouldn't use a laxative for gastroparesis necessarily because, again, they're having more of an issue with actually stimulating um, uh, propulsion here. This is more of an issue of uh, they usually have kind of these dry, desiccated sort of stools that are just very hard to pass. Um, and so typically what you're going to find with a lot of these agents is we're trying to increase the water content of the stool. So we're trying to try to, to get it more moist, try to uh, uh, get it uh, more slippery, so to speak. Uh, and we can increase water content and, and, and salt into the GI tract. And then when you increase that water content, it's going to fill up the volume of the, the GI tract. And what does that stimulation do? What makes you want to go, right? So again, having those stretch receptors being activated, if you're drawing a lot of water into the GI tract, it's going to say, hey, we got to go hit the bathroom, right? And that's going to help kind of push things along and, and get rid of it. So there's several different types we'll talk about here and in, in, in the indications when you might use one versus another. Did you guys hear that there was a, uh, there's a new paper that came out recently in this uh, International Journal of Gastroenterology. They said there's a genetic link to diarrhea. Oh. It says it runs in your genes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You seem really interested. You're really into that for a second. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, when might you use a laxative? What are some cases where you might want to use one? Yeah, just general constipation. That's a good one. What else uh, can I use that? Yeah, so getting ready for any kind of like bowel procedure. So if you want to kind of clear out the system, getting ready for a colonoscopy, um, you know, that is one thing you can definitely uh, use some laxatives for. And again, it's going to be um, differing in the types of drugs you're going to use and the different doses you're going to use. Because again, when I'm trying to get someone ready for surgery, I want to get everything gone immediately, right? Uh, at least within a 12, 24 hour period versus if it's just kind of, you know, routine, typical kind of intermittent constipation, like you can use something a lot less kind of severe in those cases. So we'll look at the, some different um, uses for these when you might use one drug versus another. Again, the big thing to watch out for, especially with a lot of these agents, uh, having the availability over the counter is if patients are trying to self-treat, they may be covering up kind of an underlying bowel disease. So if they have an issue to where they're having this constipation, if it's a neurologic uh, issue, if it's um, uh, an uh, actual physical impingement, any kind, of, any kind of issues here, they could be potentially covering it up. And so that's why it's one of those things where you don't want them to be treating themselves constantly. You want them to at least, you know, try a short self-course. If that does not work, then they need to go get checked out by somebody, right? So general side effects when you're using these laxatives, you see nausea associated with them, abdominal cramping, diarrhea, obviously, if you kind of go overboard. Um, you want to hit the happy medium where they're having, you know, decent, well-formed stools, you know, maybe one, two times a day, but you don't want them to be the point where they're having watery diarrhea consistently, unless you're trying to do something like a bowel prep or a bowel clean out where you want them to get everything out pretty, pretty uh, quickly there. And then uh, what's interesting, though, is that if you have chronic use of uh, these laxatives, and so can you imagine anyone who might abuse laxatives? Yeah, so some patients with eating disorders, they might be abusing laxatives in order to um, uh, get rid, uh, to lose weight, you know, to, to kind of pass things through more quickly. That's one person who might be abusing this. Other people who may be just self-treating kind of way too consistently, you can become dependent on these, especially with some of the agents we'll talk about, like our, our stimulants and things like that. Um, you know, you become dependent on this. Your GI tract just gets used to having that effect around. And so if you're not really used to doing it yourself, then once you take those drugs away, it can be very difficult to, to kind of um, initiate your own defecation and things like that. So 
you can run into issues. It's kind of cathartic colon syndrome that occurs rarely, but it can happen with this kind of chronic use. Um, where you have a lot of uh, inflammation. You can end up having atrophy of some of the outer muscle layers because, again, you're not really having to stimulate them yourself in a lot of cases. Um, damage to the nerve plexus here. And then run into things like malabsorption and you know, disrupting the intestinal flora. Lots of bad things. Because so again, we recommend short courses only if possible, um, really for just the, the shortest period of time you need. And again, one of the biggest things you can do to help with uh, patients' uh, stooling habits is, is what? Yeah, lots of water, right? So again, chronically, I think uh, Americans typically are pretty dehydrated. So again, what? Fiber, good exercise, diet, there's so many non-pharmacologic means in order to fix this problem that most patients need to do that first. This is good to kind of get them over the hump essentially, but once they are uh, at a stage where they are not acutely constipated, this is when you need to get them to initiate some of these non-pharmacologic means because that's going to be the most effective thing for them in the long run. Um, I can't tell you how many ER visits we have every single year in the PZR for abdominal pain, and guess what it is? Do a KUB, do the x-ray, guess what? They're full of stool. That is uh, their FOS, right? Um, and so you want to, and that's, that's the, the thing. And I remember even my cousin, his daughter was two at the time, two or three. And, um, he said, Oh my gosh, she's going to the ER right now. I think she's going to die. This is the worst abdominal pain she's ever had. And I said, she's fine. She's just constipated. And sure enough, two hours later, he's like, how'd you know? And I was like, because all these kids show up, they go to the ER middle of the night for constipation. It's really something that, uh, if managed well on the outside, like you really shouldn't ever need to, to take someone in for something like that. Occasionally it's something more severe, but most of the time it's just, there, there's FOS, right? It's for stool, not anything else. Um, so the main varieties we're going to have here include our stimulants, our irritant laxatives. We're going to have bulk forming laxatives. Primary thing going to be here is dietary fiber, stool softeners, and then looking at some osmotic agents. So our stimulant irritant laxatives, these tend to be the strongest. You're going to get kind of the most bang for your buck out of uh, these type of agents. Um, this includes things like castor oil. Uh, it's kind of an old-timey sort of remedy, probably not used too, too commonly anymore, but it can increase motility, directly stimulating the GI tract to increase uh, urge for defecation, and will also kind of help with uh, secreting more water and electrolytes into the GI tract. Again, that helps to stimulate things with that, with that stretch. You say, okay, yes, we need to defecate. Um, Senna is going to be another very common one. Bisacodyl, both of these are, will directly stimulate colonic motility. Um, and the biggest things you're going to expect to see is that abdominal cramps, diarrhea associated with kind of overuse of these, and then potentially muscle weakness over the long run. If you kind of use these too frequently, too long a period of time, these are the biggest offenders as far as um, causing atrophy of those muscles and, and it being very difficult for patients to uh, defecate without the presence of these. So again, short courses, try to get them to you know, change their diet, all these other things, get them off of these stimulants. The only way is for short courses. So the next up, we have our bulk forming or non-digestible dietary fiber. These are really good because they help to kind of emulsify um, a stool that's in the GI tract. They're going to help to increase that kind of stretch receptor response in order to increase that urge for defecation. So these are really good agents. A lot of them are uh, things you probably have seen at your grandma's house or something like that, where you have things like psyllium or metamucil, uh, methyl cellulose, or citrus. Those are kind of the most common ones. Um, what dosage form do these normally come in? Yeah, a lot of powder, and so it's a very kind of a gritty kind of uh, texture to it. A lot of people don't like that, and so it's one of the uh, kind of predominant things why people don't stick with this therapy, even though it's very effective, very few side effects associated with it, not a lot of issues. Um, we do want to be careful. Anytime you're given um, these, these non-digestible fibers, you need to separate it out from other medications because there is a risk for having some of it binding up or not, uh, not absorbing quite so much of the drug. So either take the, the interacting medications an hour before the fiber or do it two or three hours after the fiber. So that way you make sure it gets absorbed appropriately. Um, and basically, they're just going to work by you mix uh, a lot of water with the, uh, with the fiber. Again, a lot of these patients are dehydrated anyways. They probably need to be drinking lots of water. Um, that will go and increase the, kind of that water content and, and and it, again, doesn't get absorbed very well, so it all stays there in the GI tract, increasing the motility, that stretch, you know, it, it all increases that urge for defecation. And so, um, again, other big side effects, flatulence, some cramps, but again, very well tolerated for the most part. And so this is a very good um, kind of non-habit forming, sort of non-tolerance um, uh, producing sort of laxative, which is probably okay for kind of daily use. And so I see so many older patients who are on it just to kind of keep normal kind of bowel health. Next up, we have our stool softeners. Um, these are uh, just like you might imagine. They help to kind of emulsify the, the stools in the colon. So again, trying to kind of get in there, make them a little bit more, the water content higher, trying to make them a little bit easier to, to pass. And so you have things like mineral oil, uh, you have things like glycerin. Uh, glycerin suppositories are a very common thing we use a lot in pediatric patients, especially like the real tiny infants. Uh, we'll go ahead and use glycerin suppositories. 
There's also another one called docusate or colase. Uh, it's another very common, um, usually an oral medication we can uh, administer to help kind of emulsify the, uh, the stools there. Again, increased water content, they lubricate the stool, make it easier for them to pass. All right, then uh, next up you have your osmotic agents. And again, if you're uh, thinking about like how quickly do some of these agents work, so how quickly do you think a stimulant laxative works? Pretty, pretty quick, right? So it's considered a stimulant. So yeah, it's probably going to get in there and kind of stimulate the GI tract directly. It's going to work pretty quick. How about like a, like a fiber? Probably not as quick. Maybe no, not, it's not going to be like kind of one of these immediate sort of things there. So it won't really, because um, uh, again, it needs to kind of get in there, draw water into it, you know, take some time there. So, uh, still softeners, what do you think? Pretty slow, right? It's going to take some time for them really to, to get to work. How about these osmotic agents? When I say osmotic, what do you think I mean? They have a high tenacity to them, right? They're uh, highly hypertonic. They're going to draw a ton of water into the GI tract, and these are going to work very quick, right? These are going to be very, very fast. So a lot of these are enemas that you can administer. And again, one of the most kind of strong signals you can have for defecation is if you administer these uh, as an enema. Administer these rectally. Uh, and then that way you'll go ahead and get a ton of volume expansion there in the rectum. That's going to directly stimulate, hey, yes, I need to go to the bathroom. And that's going to uh, stimulate defecation pretty quickly. So if we need to have someone who has having like acute abdominal pain due to constipation, enemas are a great way to go ahead and, and, and get rid of all that stuff, right? Um, so anyway, so, uh, so a couple of ones you can use. Some of these are going to be oral agents. A lot of these uh, are also going to be available um, uh, rectally as well. So things like magnesium sulfate. Remember magnesium, we talked about magnesium hydroxide. That was used for what? Yeah, as an antacid, right? So we mentioned that magnesium can actually cause diarrhea, right? So we mentioned that the calcium usually causes constipation. Magnesium can cause diarrhea. Um, so this is another one you could potentially use by itself. Um, there's also magnesium citrate, which is, I mentioned that kind of the green rocket. Um, basically, it's a bottle. It kind of looks like Sprite or something. You take that, uh, and they run like a rocket to the to the bathroom, right? So it works very, very well from that standpoint. You can also use things like lactulose and mannitol. It's kind of sugary molecules that don't get absorbed very well. And then one of the more common ones are going to be uh, being used is polyethylene glycol. Anyone ever heard of Miralax? So Miralax usually comes uh, as a powder, usually orally administered, and this is going to be, you know, you can use it either daily for kind of normal kind of bowel health. So we have a lot of kids that get put on this prophylactically. A lot of adult patients will be put on this prophylactically. Again, it can work for just kind of normal, just stimulation, normal, normal defecation. You can also give this in the form called Go Lightly. Anyone heard of Go Lightly before? It's a big four liter jug. Uh, that you go ahead and has this powder in it and you would fill it up uh, with water and then they need to drink that usually for bowel preps for surgery, right? Uh, we'll use it occasionally for certain poisonings when you want to get things flushed out of the GI tract more quickly. We'll use this uh, and again, there's nothing go lightly about it. Um, they're going to go pretty heavy, right? Because again, this is a ton of fluid, a ton of electrolytes. Uh, um, you know, it's very uh, hypertonic sort of solution. It's going to draw a lot of water in and get them on, on the commode pretty quickly. Yes, ma'am. Um, no, so uh, suppository uh, itself, so when you think about like a suppository, think about usually, um, it's usually in like kind of a, a cocoa butter sort of, um, uh, uh, usually put it like in a cast or some kind of like dye sort of thing where they will fill it up with kind of this uh, liquid form of the cocoa butter, it'll cool down, it'll kind of solidify into a form. That way when it gets into the rectum, it will melt and then can cause it either if it's a stimulant like bisacodyl um, or if it's like glycerin or something like that, it can just directly kind of stimulate, um, you know, kind of emulsify whatever's there and, and, and stimulate defecation. Um, always important to remember, make sure they take the wrapping off of the uh, suppository first because it actually comes in a very sharp foil. Um, so. You may think it's common sense, but common sense ain't so common, as some of you may know. Um, but if you have like, something like an enema, that's usually going to be in a, in a bottle, usually like, say, you know, anywhere between 66 to 130 some odd mLs. And that will be like in a kind of a squeeze bottle. And so I didn't really put instruction on how to administer these because you'll see them on all the bottles, essentially. But next time you go to like CVS or Walgreens, go look at those. It's very kind of awkward looking pictures where the patient will actually like lubricate the tip of it. It will uh, insert it into the rectum. They'll basically squeeze all that fluid in and they try to hold it in as long as you can. And that will, that, that pressure, that stretch will stimulate the urge for defecation that they can go release, right? And so again, um, we'll do that very frequently for a lot of our ER patients because it gets, you get a lot of bang for your buck. Like you go to the ER, you want them to do something, that'll do something, right? And that'll get rid of the stool and then they feel tons better, abdominal pain's all gone, and then they can go, uh, they get discharged home, right? They feel like they got taken care of pretty well there. Um, but again, it depends on the type of patient you're gonna deal with, right? So um, if you're dealing with like an infant, they don't really care, like rectally administer medications, they got no problem with, right? Because they're oblivious. Um, think about like a teenage female, 
they probably don't want to have, uh, uh, you know, an enema. It's pretty, pretty embarrassing, or I guess any teenager for that matter. And the adult patients are less likely to really um, kind of jive with that. So some of our ER docs, they're uh, kind of old school guys, and they're just like, I don't really care. Just give them an enema and get them out of here, right? May not be best for patient care, but again, it's one of those kind of quick acting things. It's going to work, and it's going to work great usually. Um, yeah, so just keep in mind that you know usually the suppositories don't work quite as quickly, but the the enemas are going to be the, where you get a lot of bang for your buck. So I'll mention um, the, the agents we use for that more specifically in just a second here. But things like polyethylene glycol, the nice thing is it's kind of um, even though it, it's uh, very hypertonic, you don't see a ton of like fluid or electrolyte shift necessary for the patient, so they don't really get dehydrated based on this, but there's a, a lot of fluid that's in there. They're going to be able to pass that pretty quickly, and so go lightly is very good for valve clean out or just using Miralax by itself. Just mix it with water, and you can use that daily for um, you know just normal bowel health. Usually, they'll say like one scoopful a day. Usually, quite out like 17 grams or something like that, but you know, it's pretty easy, pretty easy dosing for, for that. Okay. Um, so anyway, so a couple of anti-diarrheal agents. So these would do the opposite effect and actually prevent someone from having uh, diarrhea, hopefully. And so these are good. Um, actually, in, when, when are some cases where you may not want to cause constipation and kind of stop diarrhea? Yeah, when would you just like, you know, they're having diarrhea, they're like, hey, can you give me something for this? And you're like, you just, just tough it out. Yeah, usually infectious causes. You don't want them necessarily hold on to bacteria longer than they need to. So you think about things like, you know, Trigella, or you think about things like some of these um, Salmonella, things like that. They probably don't want to have necessarily to, to keep that stuff in there for any longer than it needs to. So we do go ahead and just let them have the diarrhea just make sure they hydrate very well um, otherwise. But in some cases, if occasionally a patient's having diarrhea, say secondary like food or something like that, then it would be okay for them to use these kind of short course anti-diarrheals. And basically what these are doing as they will decrease GI motility locally. And most of the time, they're actually going to work at opioid receptors. And normally, think opioids, what do you think of? Hmm? Yeah, think about analgesics, think about morphine, think about heroin. Like These are basically doing the same thing as uh, your uh, opioids, but they don't actually don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So based on the structure, um, they are not able to cross the blood-brain barrier, and they do not cause any of the euphoria that you see with that. And so um, we can utilize these just for their GI effects. Does anyone know what like, a common side effect for opioids is? Constipation, absolutely. So this is why we use it for the, these reasons. We have diphenoxylate. This one actually gets mixed with atropine. Um, the reason why it does that is not because atropine itself is uh, causing any antimuscarinic effects in the GI tract. It's actually because it doesn't get absorbed very well from the GI tract. It's going to have a lot of local actions. But when you, if you had a patient who's trying to abuse this and, like, say, crush it up and try to inject it, the atropine would make them have such a nasty high uh, they wouldn't, wouldn't want to do it anymore. So it's kind of an abuse deterrent. Can't say how effective it is because when people are trying to get high, there you know if there's a well, there's a way in a lot of cases. But that's the reason why you'll see that in there. And then the other one, uh, it's very commonly available at the counter is loperamide or modium. Again, a lot of these agents are available over the counter, so it's one of those things where you got to be careful when they're self-treating. Make sure you're asking about over-the-counter meds to make sure you get a full med history for what they're taking. Obviously, constipation being the biggest adverse effect. People who are abusing this potentially, you know, there's things kind of this mega colon that can happen. It can be very bad. So um, just again, short course use. If they're having issues or having this kind of constant diarrhea, that could be indicative of something else, some other kind of disease state. They need to get checked out for this sort of thing. And then bismuth, uh, uh, we already talked about this one previously. When we were talking about treatment for H. pylori. Uh, also can be used as an anti-diarrheal uh, agent as well. Kind of helps to inhibit some of those intestinal secretions and, and whatnot. Um, so again, just be aware of that, that salicylate toxicity, who not to use it in, et cetera. So it can be another agent used there. Okay. Um, let's go and do a 10 minute break now. We'll come back and then talk about inflammatory bowel disease. All right, any questions from the first half? Everyone <laughs> use the restroom if they had the urge to, right? Sometimes, you know, just hearing about these things may stimulate people. It depends. Okay, um, of course, helicopter decides to go off this very instant. Okay, so have you guys covered any inflammatory bowel disease yet? Crohn's disease, ulcerative, all right, good. So you guys should be somewhat familiar with it. So what's the difference between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis? Well, both are autoimmune. One, which one has skips lesions? Crohn's, absolutely. So Crohn's, think about it being more of kind of a global sort of, uh, and again, think about it for our purposes. We hear about it being a little different. Anyway, yeah, so for our purposes, just kind of think of Crohn's disease as being kind of more of a GI-wide sort of issue happening kind of all throughout the small intestine, large intestine, whereas ulcerative colitis, main, yeah, I mean, the colon, rectum, and so that sort of uh, kind of distal end of the GI tract. So kind of think about that from that standpoint, because that'll be important about what type of drugs we're going to use and which dosage forms we're going to use, right? Um, so that'll be more important as we look at that in just a few seconds here.
So um, we don't have a, a full idea why people get ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, just like we don't have a full idea of why people get rheumatoid arthritis and things like that. These autoimmune conditions usually going to be a mix of multiple factors. So there could be environmental roles. It could be genetic factors. Lots of different things are going to play into this. And so regardless, we don't really know why it occurs in all, all cases, but we can at least treat it when it, when it does happen. Um, obviously, uh, you know, different things like smoking. Some people actually find increase or studies will find increased risk for Crohn's disease, but decreased risk for ulcerative colitis. So it's like, I kind of take your pick if you're a smoker there. Uh, some people feel like even NSAIDs might have some, uh, some influence here. So again, multifactorial, just know that it's lots of different things. 20 years from now, I might have a full answer. Who knows for now, at least. But looking at a normal kind of functioning, um, immune system and how it's going to interact with the GI tract. You're going to see here that um, what you're basically having is the immune system is being way too overactive against itself. Um, can't really differentiate itself against you know, kind of foreign antigens. And so it's going to start to, to break down and destroy this mucosal tissue here. And so you might imagine what type of side or what kind of effects would you expect to see in a Crohn's or uh, ulcerative colitis patient? Hmm? Diarrhea can be a big one. You know, bleeding potentially. A lot of crampy pains, a lot, yeah. So again, lots of different manifestations of this, but just know that again, ultimately it's going to be an autoimmune condition, and so that would stand to reason. How are we going to treat this? The immune system is too overactive. I'm going to get to suppress, suppress the immune system. Absolutely, so we're going to find some specific ways that we can actually suppress that immune system. We're going to look at steroids. We're going to look at non-steroidal agents. We're going to look at drugs that are specifically targeted against certain inflammatory cytokines. So again, keep that in mind. That the main mantra here is going to be immunosuppression. And then the flip side of that is if I suppress the immune system, what do I run the risk of? Opportunistic infection, right? So that's always going to be a risk when you're running uh, into these immunosuppressive drugs. So Again, we're seeing this kind of inappropriate response, this kind of malfunctioning defense system here against, you know, just not only the, the GI tract, but also just the normal the normal GI flora that would be there anyway. And so you can see kind of this leaky up at the little barrier. You're going to notice that all these T cells and, and whatnot are going to get activated. The whole thing, the system is going to be kind of an overdrive, essentially. Um, and so, again, just going to go into more detail, you're going to see that with all sort of colitis, you're mainly going to find that the inflammation primarily is going to be relic. Uh, you know, kind of situated mostly in the mucosa, like the rectum, the colon, the primary places there, versus when you're dealing with like Crohn's disease, it can be much more diffuse. It can be kind of throughout the, you know, small intestine and, and, and large intestine there. Um, again, you're going to find that the treatment only differs really in, in where we're going to be applying the medications. In general, the medications themselves will stay the same because, again, the pathophysiology is pretty similar amongst the uh, both disease states here. So again, um, looking at kind of a normal colon tissue versus when you have ulcerative colitis, again, having um, disruption in things like the goblet cells, you can have all these kind of abscesses that can form here. There's also some concern about having kind of this, um, uh, these kind of infections, these kind of local areas of infection that kind of get sequestered off that can be an issue. So if you ever hear um, uh, small intestine bowel, uh, I'm trying to think of what's the uh, SIBO. Camera on top of my head right now. When we get to it, we'll talk about it there. But there's also be, can potentially be some antibiotics we can actually use to treat. Because again, GI tract is full of bacteria, right? So if they get kind of sequestered off in their own little areas, they can sit there and cause local infections and that can lead to issues as well. So anyway, um, looking at their kind of presentation, a lot of it has to do with things like, you know, looking at severity. So seeing, um, you know, how many bowel movements they're having a day, looking at is there any blood present, things like that. Um, obviously, our goal here is to try to get patients into, uh, try to decrease their symptoms as much as we can and try to get them into remission and try to minimize side effects where, where possible. We're going to see this can be a, a little difficult to do, especially with some of our more kind of non-specific drugs we're going to be dealing with. Um, but again, you know, I'm not going to go into the di diagnosis specifically. You know, you get that in other classes, but again, a lot of it has to do with family history, colonoscopies, different uh, procedures like that. So anyway, so looking at our therapeutic options, here's kind of the full list here. So we're going to see with ulcerative colitis, we're going to see that, and when I mention topical here, I don't mean actually applying it to the skin. I mean topical is applying to just strictly into the GI tract. So when you're thinking topical here, we're talking about like rectally administered medications, right? And so we're going to see that um, you can use rectally administered medications uh, for ulcerative colitis. You're not really going to be able to use those specifically for Crohn's disease. And why do you think that is? Yeah, and, and if I'm uh, if I apply a medication rectally, how far up the GI tract do you think I can get it? Maybe up to like you know the um, you know the splenic flexure, maybe not much far beyond that, right? So again, if you're thinking about ulcerative colitis mainly being um, situated more towards like the rectum, and again, it depends on symptomatology, depends on where the inflammation actually is, because you can have um, certainly with UC, you can have you know inflammation that extends beyond that. In which case, those topically administered medications may still not be super effective, right? So we'll look at that when you might choose one versus the other. First off, we're going to talk about amino uh, salicylates. 
corticosteroids. We'll talk about certain immunosuppressants. And then we're going to get in, into a couple of immuno, uh, monoclonal antibodies we can use to treat this. Uh, we'll look at probiotics, nutritional therapy, surgery, et cetera. And then with Crohn's disease, typically you're going to find that the treatments options are going to be the same between these. Here's where we're going to use potentially some antibiotics. And then also a few antidiarrheals might show up here as well. So again, think about the therapy being pretty similar between the two. So the first group here are the amino salicylates. Um, sulfasalazine is going to be one of the primary ones you're going to see being used here. And basically, it's a prodrug. So we mentioned prodrugs are inactive on their own, right? They have to be broken down typically into their active product. And so this one actually gets broken down into sulfapyridine and this 5-amino salicylic acid, or 5. And basically, uh, another name for this is mesalamine. We'll see mesalamine by itself is also going to be used as a drug itself. But looking at this ASA, do you remember any other drugs that get abbreviated as ASA? Aspirin, right? So this is going to have very similar activities as aspirin does, and the fact it's going to be kind of like acting like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So it's going to be one of the big ways you're going to see some activity with these drugs is they're kind of acting like aspirin would, uh, essentially. So again, metabolized by the colonic bacteria, that's what's going to activate the drug, and then is going to help with things like inhibition of cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase. Uh, by inhibiting those pathways, you inhibit the amount of inflammatory cytokines being produced, you start to tamp down that immune response, right? You tamp down that inflammation there. Um, We'll see these can be administered both rectally and can be administered orally, depending on how you're treating it, how diffuse the disease is going to be. If it's really anything that's kind of past that splenic flexure, then really oral medications are going to really be needed. So for like Crohn's disease, oral medications are going to be required for more extensive ulcerative colitis, oral medications are needed. But if it's just, you know, say a proctitis, topical medications are going to work just fine in these cases. So kind of think about that when you think about the patient presentation and your drug selection here. For the most part, these are tolerated pretty well, but you could see potentially, you know, abdominal pain, diarrhea associated with these medications, especially as they get broken down by the colonic bacteria. Um, rarely do you see, you know, things like blood dyscrasias, but it's, you know, a theoretical risk, mostly pretty well tolerated for the most part. So, and then we have uh, mesalamine, or this 5 amino salicylic acid. This one I see used much more commonly. Um, and this one, again, is going to be working specifically through that aspirin sort of action by inhibiting COX, um, the enzyme, and then inhibiting a lot of those inflammatory cytokines, like prostaglandins and, and things like that. Um, usually there's less uh, side effects associated with this than sulfasalazine. Some people have an allergic reaction to the sulfa portion of that. You don't really see that so much here with the mesalamine, which is nice. And there's several different versions that are available here. Some of these are going to be available as uh, delayed release tablets, so that way they kind of get through the stomach uh, and can work a little bit farther down the GI tract where they really start to kick in, which is useful for some of these patients. Um, some of these are going to be available as a suppository, and some of them are going to be available as an enema. So just be aware there's different dosage forms, and you kind of custom tailor to how your patient's presenting, kind of what their, their actual symptoms are going to be here. Um, again, so like this canasa, this roasa, they're going to be more specifically located uh, or rectally administered, better for kind of this proctitis, kind of this kind of more distal um, uh, colitis you're having with those patients. Otherwise, oral medications work all the way through the GI tract. Another one we have called osalazine. This is actually just a dimer of mesalamine, which what's a dimer? You just put two of them together, right? So again, they get broken down, and you basically have two molecules, mesalamine. So again, it's a prodrug, has to be split in half, and then it's going to be working essentially just like mesalamine will be. And then it's mesalazide. Again, this is going to be uh, basically another prodrug where it's uh, this, uh, mesalamine was going to have this inert carrier molecule that really doesn't do anything. They just add it, add it as a uh, prodrug so that way. You know, and the reason why you want the colonic bacteria to, to break it down is because, you know, um, you know, early up in the GI tract, especially like in the stomach, how many bacteria normally live there? Should be sterile for the most part. You might have some H. pylori there, but it really should be sterile for the most part. It needs to get down to the actual large intestine, where that's where a lot of the, the bacteria are going to be living at, right? So it's some small intestine, but certainly in the large intestine as well. Um, and so that's where it's going to be useful for it to get uh, broken down to the active portions, and then they can actually start to have its uh, mechanism there, right? So you don't want them to act too early, otherwise they're not going to be that effective. Does that make sense? All right, so then next we have our corticosteroids, and I'll talk about some um, pathways a little bit later to kind of show you when you're going to use which of these drugs kind of when. Um, but looking at corticosteroids, so obviously just like we would use this for something like uh, other immune conditions or allergic reactions like uh, anaphylaxis or for asthma, things like that, corticosteroids can be very powerful anti-inflammatories we can use here as well. Again, whenever you're using corticosteroids, it's always preferable to use it as locally acting of a formulation as possible because, again, orally administered meds um, have a host of side effects we've talked about before. So what are some of the side effects? Weight gain. Why do you get weight gain? Fluid retention. What does it do to your blood sugar? She goes up. Yeah, some local, yeah, so I mean, uh, it's usually you're going to see more of the inhaled corticosteroids, but you see a thrush. 
think about like some some people get like kind of uh, kind of the CNS effects where sometimes their mood can kind of change. Like some people just get really kind of um, kind of very cranky when they're on uh, corticosteroids. It just really depends uh, on the patient how they're going to react to that. But ton of st- uh, side effects, glaucoma it gets worse, and osteoporosis is worse, and all that. So we like to use as locally acting drugs as we can. And so, again, we know they have multiple anti-inflammatory effects. These drugs are working just the same. Um, Topically administered drugs we have are going to be usually hydrocortisone-based. And, again, hydrocortisone is pretty uh, wimpy on the whole scale of um, corticosteroids, but it works just like our cortisol. Hydrocortisone is cortisol, essentially, so it's just like our body would be producing. And it will come as either an enema, a suppository, or it can actually have a a rectal foam that can be administered. All of these are trying to um, stick around in the rectum and in the the large intestines kind of as long as possible, so they're formulated that way. Um, so an example, like this colocort, you know, this is going to be basically a 60 ml uh, enema that you'd have to administer. And again, you know, this PR stands for per rectum, per rectum right? So that's going to be administering that um, either daily or twice a day. And again, with these uh, administration instructions, make sure, like, you know, as opposed to like an enema, like an enema, you really only want to hold on to it as long as you need to until you need to go to the bathroom, right? Because again, you are trying to get rid of the feces there. For this one, it's one of those things where you actually want to try to hold on to as long as you can because the longer it's there, the more effective the drug's going to be essentially. So that's going to be one thing. Um, orally, you're going to see um, some drugs that can be used include things like prednisone, methylprednisone, even budesonide, which normally we see as an inhaled corticosteroid. You can see sometimes being used here. Um, when might I want to use like oral or IV corticosteroids? When is that going to be most utilized? Because I said, there's all these side effects associated with it, so when would be the best time to use it? Yeah, when you're having really bad symptoms. So if you're having someone who's, like, relapsing or they're having, like, very severe symptoms they're not really responding to anything else, like, this is where oral or, or IV medication can be very useful. Um, so think about that. Think about you want to hold off on these as long as you can. But we'll have patients who will have, um, you know, pretty progressive uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis will come into the ER with an exacerbation, and we have to start them on IV corticosteroids because they're very effective at tamping down that inflammation. But, again, you want them on, to be on as short a time as possible to mitigate those side effects there, right? Um, so, again, we know weight gain being a big side effect here, glucose intolerance, osteoporosis, all those things that are going to be associated with that. The more chronic you're on these medications for, the more likely you are to see these effects. Typically, you avoid a lot of this over the rectally administered um, hydrocortisones is where you're going to get the most limited effect you can. And we mentioned, like, you know, the rectally administered drugs is pretty good because what, what, uh, what's kind of unique about the rectum? Highly vascular, pretty thin mucous membrane. You do get some drug absorption. So this isn't going to be um, it's kind of just locally acting, as you would see with, like, say, uh, an inhaled corticosteroid or, say, like an ophthalmic corticosteroid or something like that. But these, uh, are again, are going to be preferable to orally administered or IV administered drug uh, steroids here. Right? Make sense? Yes? So, per rectum is better unless you have free vascular disease. Or... Or if it's more diffuse to where, like, a rectally administered med is not going to be that effective, right? So for Crohn's, that's not going to be a great option, right? Because you're going to have such um, diffuse disease. Yeah, you're not, that hydrocortisone might not be great there. And sometimes you'll see some patients, especially ulcerative colitis patients, if it's more kind of diffuse uh, throughout the colon, they may actually get uh, PR and oral medications, try to get kind of the most effect there kind of at the very distal portions. Then you still have some oral that will kind of work on kind of the, the earlier portions there, the large intestine. So it just depends on, on the patient. But this is... Steer you away from the adverse effects that are here. Yeah, it mitigates them, but that doesn't get rid of them completely, right? Because we said the rectum is very highly vascular, like just like, yeah, so it's still there, it's still going to get some absorption, but it won't be as bad as if I was giving you like, you know, big doses of methylprednisolone and IV or something like that. Yep. Okay, so moving on, next we're going to have our immunosuppressants, and some of these are going to come back up again uh, when you're talking about um, like rheumatoid conditions, like rheumatoid arthritis. This is going to come up again when you talk about things like transplant, a lot of these drugs, and then also chemotherapy or another place for, for oncology purposes. These drugs keep coming up again and again. So, we'll, uh, And again, um, this is very useful as an immunosuppressant. If it's tamed down the immune system, what type of cancers do you think it's would be useful for? What type of cancers where your immune system is just rapidly dividing all those white cells? Leukemia, absolutely. So we use things like methotrexate for leukemia very commonly. So we use this, you see a lot of leukemias in children, so we use a ton of methotrexate for those kids. We use a lot of uh, more captive hearing, things like that. But anyway, these drugs are going to be working as uh, a few different ways to suppress the immune system. The first ones we're going to see are these thiopurines, and basically what they do is they actually decrease the metabolism of purines uh, that get incorporated into DNA, right? So again, when you're producing RNA, 
and DNA, you're going to need these nucleotides to get incorporated into the DNA. If you have these kind of faults, um, these kind of anti-metabolites that will get incorporated into the DNA, they actually prevent these further strand elongations. So we'll cover this more in detail when we get to uh, the chemotherapy section, but essentially what you're seeing is that it prevents DNA replication. Um, this is affecting mostly rapidly dividing cells, because again, rapidly dividing cells are having a pretty constant proportion of them entering into uh, the different, you guys know, covered the different cell cycles. Right, so you remember like the S phase, the M phase, G0, all that good stuff. You remember what the S phase was of that? Replication. Was where you're producing new DNA, right? M phase is that mitosis where actually uh, reproduce the cell, but the S phase is where you're making new DNA. And this is where a lot of these are working to inhibit new production of DNA. And if you don't produce DNA, guess what? Those cells eventually die off, right? Apoptosis occurs and that's and you get rid of those cells. So this is basically what that's doing is trying to suppress the immune system by preventing replication of a lot of these white cells. Um, now, a lot of these drugs were typically given much lower doses than we are of, than we would say for like uh, oncology purposes, right? Because if you have a leukemia, you want to get rid of all those cells. So you're giving a really big dose to try to knock them all out. For these immune condi autoimmune conditions, you typically are using much lower doses and they take a long time for it to really kick into effect. So say three to six months before you really start to see really kind of maximal benefits from these drugs. But two of them we have here are called azathioprine and six from are the two most common thiopurines. Um, Again, they just mimic purines that get incorporated in DNA and prevent replication of the cells, right, by inhibiting that DNA production. And as you might imagine, myelosuppression and secondary infections are going to be the biggest risk you're going to run into, right? So again, you're treating these patients, trying to tamp down this, uh, their inflammatory system, but again, secondary infections are going to be a big risk. Viruses, bacteria, fungus, anything could potentially uh, creep up and cause an infection. Next one, you're going to have cyclosporin. You guys remember we talked about cyclosporin before? For stasis was, was used for what? Yeah, chronic dry eye. So sometimes you can have patients um, like that uh, uh, Sogren's uh, syndrome where they basically have really chronic dry eye. Um, that's due to the kind of uh, ramped up immune system. And so that's why we give restasis because it actually helps to inhibit release of interleukin-2. So by doing that, you inhibit T cell activation, you inhibit that inflammatory reaction that can actually help with the eye. Helps with um, these patients who are taking uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease as well. Uh, big things to watch out for is it can cause nephrotoxicity. So you have to watch your renal function to see if there's any changes with that. Looking for things like hypertension developing here. And again, infections are gonna be another big risk. Okay, because again, you're suppressing that immune system. And then we have methotrexate. Um, we use methotrexate very frequently. It's a very good go-to kind of uh, mild immunosuppressant. We use it a lot for chemotherapy. Um, this one actually works as a folic acid antagonist. And so folic acid is going to be another thing that's really useful for producing things like thymidine, these kind of other nucleotides. If you inhibit the activities of folic acid, you're going to prevent new DNA production, and that's lead to eventual cell death for those immune cells. So um, again, you have to be, be careful with this one because, again, if a patient, um, you know, you can end up having um, issues of myelosuppression with this. You can see uh, uh, hepatotoxicity with this one. I don't forget my, uh, my aunt was, was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer and had to be put on methotrexate. She's very bummed out because she's like, I can't drink my wine anymore. The oncologist, I can't drink any more wine because of this hepatotoxicity that can occur there. And I was like, oh, well, you still want breast cancer when you're done. She's like, I guess so. I guess, I guess it works out. Anywho, myelosuppression is a big thing. Uh, stomatitis, what is that? Yeah, so we, so we mentioned rapidly dividing cells are really are going to be the big things to get hit with this. So the immune system is one. What else gets hit? GI tract, right? GI is all constantly re reproducing, producing new cells, right? So the mouth gets hit. Uh, imagine you can also see like diarrhea associated with that, which you're already having issues with. So sometimes it's hard to tell if it's an adverse reaction to the you know the methotrexate or is an issue with um, you know the actual uh, disease uh, progressing. Hard to say, but again, the end up seeing infections, hepatotoxicity, myelosuppression. Those are the big things to really worry about there. Um, again, stomatitis can be a problem because if patients are having all the significant um, you know bloody diarrhea and things like that, they could already be at risk for malnutrition. This could just worsen that potentially dehydration, malnutrition, all of that. And then looking at um, monoclonal antibody therapy. So again, you see MAV at the end. You know, it's monoclonal antibody. You know, as far as adverse reactions go, what could happen? Yeah, again, foreign protein anaphylaxis. But you're going to see we have two main ones here. We're going to have infliximab, which is Remicade, and then adalimumab, or Humira. Again, most people just call them by their brand names because they're harder to say, or easier to say, I should say. Um, and these are going to be TNF-alpha antagonists. Basically, these are antibodies that have been generated against specifically TNF-alpha, which you know is a very powerful uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. If you bind up that TNF-alpha, you can suppress that immune system. It's more targeted than you see with something like a corticosteroid, so the side effects from that standpoint are much less because it's not kind of blanket suppressing the immune system, but it helps very specifically with this type of autoimmune sort of reaction. So again, you'll see this come up again when we talk about rheumatoid arthritis and, and many other types of autoimmune conditions. This is a very uh, common drugs we use for a lot of um, uh, autoimmune conditions there in the rheumatologic world.
And also know that these agents, they cannot be given orally, right? Because they're proteins, they're going to get broken down. They have to be given IV. And usually they have a pretty long half-life, so you can give them like every few weeks, every few months, depending on, on uh, how long actually half-life uh, is going to be for. So you can see here how you're going to titrate your dose, basically. And, and um, you, know, you could do every Q8 weeks, potentially, for ulcerative colitis, right? So um, it can be beneficial because again your patients not have to come in every single week to have an injection being done for this kind of thing so again watch out for that anaphylaxis risk again because it's a suppressing tumor necrosis factor um, uh, infections are also going to be a risk is why um, oftentimes you actually want to make sure you're testing for tb beforehand right because someone has a latent tb infection this can actually lead to activation of it if you suppress their immune system okay to be very careful with that. That's why a lot of times if you ever see these commercials for things like Enbrel or Humira, things like that, they always say, make sure you check for TB beforehand because otherwise if that activates you, then you got a TB infection. That's no good, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so some other things we can try as well. Uh, we have probiotics. These, again, are going to be kind of live, non-pathogenic bacteria. Um, you have several different varieties that are available. So again, you can see here, like lactobacillus is a pretty common one. Um, uh, let's see, Sarcomyces uh, is another one, a common one I see. Again, they're all going to be pretty similar acting for the most part. Um, just be aware that these are not going to like fix anyone's Crohn's disease or also colitis, but it can help to reestablish kind of normal uh, gut flora. It can be very useful for kind of reestablishing kind of a normal environment uh, if it's been kind of affected by this kind of uh, immune reaction. And then some other therapy options like antibiotics. So again, we can get probiotics in some cases, and then other times we can get antibiotics. So we can't, we can't make up our mind, can we? Um, so antibiotics can be useful occasionally. This is mainly going to just be in, in uh, Crohn's disease. Um, ideally, you'd like to get rid of some of these more kind of pathogenic bacteria while trying to um, leave space for one of those kind of um, beneficial kind of normal flora. And so this is not used super commonly, but just be aware that some patients might do this um, or might, some patients might be prescribed this in order to, to deal with it. If they consider that there might be some kind of pathogenic bacteria causing uh, increased inf inflammation and things like ciprofloxacin can be very useful to this, uh, metronidazole as well, um, you know, each of those can kind of deal with those kind of gut bacteria pretty easily. So you may see this occasionally. Um, a couple other drugs you may see tetracycline, clothromycin, uh, but these are <laughs> probably the two main ones you might run into is, is Flagyl and then Cipro. Okay, so for treatment-wise, for ulcerative colitis, the main goals, you want to reduce or try to induce remission of their symptoms decrease that mucosal inflammation, try to remain, uh, maintain remission as long as possible, obviously your improved quality of life. Because again, if you're having to live with this kind of chronic inflammation, have this diarrhea six, eight times a day, it can be very uh, detrimental to their quality of life. So you want to help to try to prevent that as best you can. Um, again, treatment is going to be dependent on severity and then also the location of the diseases. I've kind of already alluded to pretty heavily here. So looking at the colon here, we can see obviously the, the anus into the rectum. This is where you're having mainless proctitis that occurs here. This is very good for topical treatment. Mainly what you're going to see, though, if you have this kind of more left-sided sort of uh, colitis here, this is going to be good for topical therapy. If it's kind of past that splenic flexure, as I mentioned, it's not going to be great for topical administration. Oral meds are going to be much better here. Um, occasionally, will get uh, extended all the way up, uh, towards the ilium, but again, most likely you're going to see it more kind of located uh, to the distal sort of colon here. So again, sometimes you'll see a combination of both topical and oral medications. It really just depends on how diffuse the disease is for those patients. Again, strictly for ulcerative colitis, not for Crohn's disease. <clears throat> so again, we're going to use a kind of a, uh, um, a stepwise approach here. You want to start with kind of the least severe uh, immunosuppressive medications and kind of work your way up based on their symptoms. So let's say, for instance, they have either like a proctitis or just a left-sided ulcerative colitis. You typically want to start with a topical 5 amino salicylic acids so like mesalines are a really good one to start with. If it's just a proctitis, you just do topical, right? So again, you can get that, cover that area pretty easily with one of those enemas or a suppository or foam or something like that. And then if you had like more of a left side, a little bit more diffuse kind of ulcerative colitis, you can consider doing um, the topical plus or minus an oral, right? And again, this is, you'll get a feel for how your patient's responding to medications over a period of time to see kind of what they need. At that point, so say they um, they go ahead and then they respond pretty well to that, you just maintain them on that, right? So maintain them as long as their symptoms are under control, they don't have any relapses. Um, on the other hand, though, if they don't do well with that and they're still having symptoms, you want to go ahead and keep on the, the salicylic acid because it's probably doing some benefit and then add on a topical corticosteroid. So this is where like your uh, topical hydrocortisone is going to come into play here, right? You know, not the one you put on your skin, but the actual rectal foams, uh, rectal enemas, things like that are going to be the, the primary ones you're going to administer at that point. Okay, so again, you're adding on now using two therapies here. Um, 
Notice we're going to kind of going from the least immunosuppressive to coming more immunosuppressive as they as they go along. Um, typically, if the patient responds pretty well to that, you can try to taper um, the corticosteroids as best you can. You always want to try to taper off of that if possible, just due to the fact they're still going to have some systemic effects from this. Not as much as oral or IV corticosteroids, but you try to try to taper off and just use the five ASA agents if you can. If not, then you can switch over to using something like uh, more systemic therapy, like oral 5-aminosalicylic acids or like a corticosteroid. Again, you're kind of going to more heavier gun sort of territory. And then uh, potentially, you know, um, if they're not responding at that point, then you guys have to reevaluate. And I'll show you another slide here in a second to see what happens there. So for these patients, um, when it's kind of more diffuse, again, you're looking at um, – you know, utilizing oral corticosteroids here. If that's not working, then you want to consider these immunosuppressants. You're looking at things like 6 mercaptopurine, azathioprine. If those are still not working, then you have to start to consider uh, the monoclonal antibodies. Now, as far as cost goes, which one of these do you think is the most expensive? Yeah, the monoclonal antibodies are by far and away the most expensive out of these agents. And so, again, depending on their insurance, depending on several factors, and you know, they may not be able to afford this medication. And, in fact, we have a lot of uh, programs where actually if we have a new diagnosis of UC or um, CD in the hospital, we will actually um, have a program where we can give them the first dose for free, which is usually several thousand dollars worth of drug. And then there's a program where the drug company will actually be working with them when they get out to continue their therapy, right? So that way they can at least get the first dose hopefully get into remission, and then as they get out, then they can go ahead and, and work with them to make sure they can at least try to get some sort of assistance to pay for um, continued dosing with these medications. So that can be very beneficial and can be maybe the only thing that helps keep these patients uh, able to afford these medications, right? Uh, and then always there's a, uh, the idea of maybe surgery is needed. In some cases, you may have uh, partial or, or total colectomies depending on how bad the, the symptoms are, how bad, um, how you know, treatment resistant it is. Again, that's not really going to be our purview, but just know that, again, going kind of in a stepwise approach, if Topical ASA agents are not working. What do you go to next? Topical corticosteroids. You know, if that's not working, maybe try systemic corticosteroids. Maybe try one of those immunosuppressants. So again, we're going down the ladder, getting to more and more side effect uh, ridden drugs, more and more expensive kind of um, kind of uh, big gun sort of agents. Right? Does that make sense? If they're doing more extensive or severe, you see, again, you can see where, um, especially if you're having a really kind of severe exacerbations where IV corticosteroids can be used. So if you had a patient who's coming into the ER, they, you know, were on their, you know, their mesalamine at home and, and all of a sudden they had this really bad relapse. This is where IV corticosteroids can be very useful for about a week or so to really kind of knock down their immune system, kind of get them stabilized, uh, which is good. And then you kind of would transition them over to oral corticosteroids and kind of go from there, right? And, and again, the goal is to always taper off of the oral corticosteroids as best you can. Okay, so again, and again, if they're on it for more than a week, then you do really have to taper off of those because otherwise you worry about what side effect. Yeah, so again, if you withdraw that without having any taper to it, then you may run into that adrenal suppression. So you're more likely to see these patients because they're going to be on it for, you know, at least seven to ten days, if not much longer than that. So you really need to make sure you have that, that gentle uh, withdrawal from that, right? And again, very similar, you're just going to go up the, up the ladder, use your uh, immunosuppressants, consider things like the monoclonal antibodies. Um, we're probably going to use more methotrexate, we'll see in Crohn's disease, so don't worry, but that's, that one's definitely going to come up here in a second. And what's interesting, even in some cases, um, we'll actually even use kind of more even hardcore drugs for uh, chemotherapy. So this is actually um, uh, called cytarabine. Uh, um, uh, and so sometimes we can actually use that as a, a very significant immunosuppressive agent. Uh, it's used very rarely, but occasionally you might see it used every, every once in a while. All right, so then on the flip side of that, Crohn's, as you might imagine, how do you think therapy is going to differ? More systemic, more oral medications is the primary difference here, right? So all the same agents are going to be used for the most part, but you're going to see that really can't use any topical medications because it's more diffuse, right? That's the big thing to consider there. So, you know, if the question was, you know, which of these would be inappropriate to treat Crohn's disease and you had per rectum mesalamine, that would be your correct answer, right? Uh, so think about those kind of uh, type of questions that could be asked there. Now, again, same Goals of treatment here, and again, treatment is going to still be dependent on the kind of severity, and again, location is not going to be quite as important as we saw with ulcerative colitis, mainly because it's just going to be more diffuse. So looking at here, um, so you had Crohn's disease, you know, this ileitis plus or minus colitis this is where you can again start out with our oral 5 amino salicylic acids. Occasionally, you might use antibiotics, but I don't see this quite so commonly. But then also things like oral corticosteroids could also be used here as well, right? So again, plus or minus any of these, you may use a combination of one, two, or three of these agents at this point, okay? 
Again, if they're not um, responding to that, you can use things like IV corticosteroids. Again, we're just kind of going up the chain here again. Um, azathioprine, 6 mercaptopurine can be used here potentially. Um, again, always try to taper off of those agents as best you can. Try to go back to things like your, just your um, salicylic acid agents. Um, but occasionally, you have to get the uh, more severe kind of combinations here. We're using things like methotrexate plus infliximab, you know, et cetera. Uh, I think I have another slide. Refractory. Yeah, so if you're doing more kind of refractory disease, this is where you can actually use like two of these immunosuppressives, like 6 mercaptopurine plus methotrexate. Um, and then you can consider things like infliximab, adalimumab. Now, do I need to have a patient that have to go through each, every single one of these steps before I go to the monoclonal antibody? Not necessarily, right? So you may find some patients who come in, they're so severe when you first initially diagnose them, they jump all the way to the monoclonal antibodies very early. It just depends on the patient, depends on how they're, they're presenting, how chronic the problem is, how severe it is upon diagnosis. So just keep in mind, this is not, um, you know, the, the only way to treat these patients, but as a general stepwise approach you could use depending on, on their severity. Okay, so just keep that in mind. But again, the goal is always to try to taper off as best you can um, uh, based on how they're going to tolerate it. And then obviously, you know, switch agents around based on side effects. So, you know, if they were on methotrexate and their LFT started to go through the roof, then yeah, it's probably not a good drug for them and switch over to something like 6 mercaptopurine or something else. It might be a little easier on the liver than methotrexate might be, right? Okay. So any questions on that? I think that's pretty much it. Oh, as far as uh, maintenance goes, again, that's always going to be the goal uh, of treatment. Is this ever going to be something where um, they kind of outgrow it or they that it's cured? Not typically, right? And so this is one of the problems you run into. And I actually had one, one student one year who was talking about they had a friend who had very significant Crohn's disease. And every time they go into remission, they'd be like, great, I don't need my meds anymore. And guess what happened? Go right back into it, have a really bad relapse, and then you end up in the hospital again, right? So it's one of the things where usually it's going to require kind of uh, lifelong maintenance here. Things like sulfasalazine, things like you know, five acetyl, uh, acetyl salicylic acid is going to be very useful trying to maintain remission. Um, again, but it's going to be need to custom tailor it to each patient depending on how how severe their symptoms are and what kind of the minimum level is needed to kind of keep their symptoms under control there. Um, so typically, you're going to try to see that uh, you get off of all the corticosteroids whenever possible. Really, you want to not use these as maintenance therapy whenever you can because, again, of the side effects we really worry about. These are kind of the, the main kind of chronic side effect laden sort of uh, drugs we worry about the most from the standpoint, right? Okay, so any questions on that? So this is the end of the GI section. Yes? What about a pregnant patient with Crohn's? Hmm. You would not want to do methotrexate. Um, I would need to look that up, to be honest. Like, um, I've not run into, at least in my experience, like, so, like, in the ED, adult ED, PEDS ED, general PEDS sort of spectrum of my experience, I've not run into that too too frequently. We don't have too many Crohn's kids over at Nemours who are pregnant, fortunately. <laughs> Actually, they took the stands like they're pregnant. They're not in a kid anymore. They're an adult. They can go to an adult hospital, but um, for better or for worse. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure you'd have to uh, ask someone who either probably a rheumatologist or uh, like an OB doc or something like that. Because I'm sure it happens, you know, right? Because, I mean, Crohn's patients are just as likely to get pregnant as uh, any other patient, right? Good question. Any other questions I can answer? All right, this is it for the GI section. The next two classes will be renal. Uh, I think I have one more assignment will be due at the last test, and then we'll have the last test, and then that will be it for Farm 1, right? <laughs> so two more classes. Nothing next week, right? Thanksgiving's next week. I won't be here. You guys can show up if you want. <laughs> and then, but then the following two weeks will be that, and then another test. Um, I don't remember. I set this up at the beginning of the semester, so you have to take a look. It should be posted. It should be in there. Double check if it's not. The third assignment. Let me double check. All right, I'm going to cut the recording.